Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the back row and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and make sure you turn your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. If you're enjoying what you are hearing, you can also buy me a coffee. If you'd like to learn how to become a member of the channel, all of that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Horrific Camping Stories. Right after this intro an ad will play, I'll read the first story an ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Last year, I went on a solo hike with my tent in Mielich National Park in Germany. I'm sorry you all don't speak German, please forgive me. I hadn't really planned the route precisely, I just wanted to walk north. After walking through the forest for several hours, it was slowly getting darker, so I wanted to check Google Maps to see where the nearest place to camp was. Camping is prohibited directly in the National Park Forest. However, I had no reception there, which I hadn't considered beforehand. So I walked on for a while and eventually came to a small settlement in the middle of the National Park. There were maybe five houses and a small chapel right next to a small cemetery. Since the sun was slowly setting and I needed a place to camp, I decided to ask someone who lived there. An old man was sitting in one of the gardens in front of one of the houses. I explained my situation to him and he offered me to sleep on the meadow next to the cemetery. Since I had no other option, I graciously accepted the offer. So. I set up my tent there, made myself comfortable, and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I suddenly woke up because I heard a child's voice. I sat up abruptly and initially thought I had only dreamed it. I listened to the silence of the night for a few seconds. Just as I was about to lie down, I heard a clear child's voice whispering, Hello, how are you? My eyes were wide open open. After a few seconds, I responded out of pure fear. I'll be gone tomorrow, I promise. Shortly after, I heard footsteps running through the grass away from my tent. I couldn't make sense of the entire situation at all. I was in shock and extremely tired at the same time. I sat upright in the tent for probably an hour or so and thought about what had just happened. But I couldn't come to any meaningful conclusion. Eventually, I was so exhausted that I fell back asleep. The next morning, as I was dismantling my tent, I saw the man in his garden again. I went to ask him if there are any children living in the settlement. He looked at me in surprise, and after thinking for a moment, he told me that the last child had lived here over 50 years ago but had drowned in a nearby lake back then and was buried in the cemetery right next to where I had camped that night. To this day, I don't know what to make of this story, but for me, it was definitely the creepiest experience I'd ever had in my life and I surely will not be forgetting it anytime soon. About eight years ago, two buddies and I decided to spend the night camping at Peo Duro Canyon. We are from Amarillo, Texas, so it's less than 20 miles away. This is the second largest canyon in the United States next to the Grand Canyon. And while you may be wondering what kind of spooky shit we have run into as young kids of just 17 years of age, this isn't necessarily that kind of story. Instead, us three friends were some of the only kids around our age that we knew that didn't indulge in partying. No drinking, getting stoned, none of that nature. 
So of course, we think a perfect getaway on a Friday night would be the canyon. We didn't even own camping supplies. We just went to Walmart and bought some and headed out on a whim. We make the drive and get to the state park at around 5 p.m. We enter the gate and set off to find a spot to pitch a few tents. We pulled into this campsite area that has two separate canopies with picnic tables and respective grills for cooking. In the middle of both canopies is a fire pit. Nobody was there, so we thought it was the perfect place to set up camp. We bought some coolers with soda, some hot dogs and hamburgers to grill, and a stereo to jam some tunes while we hung out and enjoyed the last few hours of daylight in the Texas summer heat. After we pitched our tent, a trunk with a small camper RV moseyed on into the site. A man and a woman got out and surveyed the area. The man saw us and waved with that friendly Texan hospitality. We waved back, of course, and went on about our business. We ate dinner and the sun was starting to set. I noticed that the man and woman didn't pitch a tent and that they probably just intended on staying in their camper. We built a fire and sat around it in some portable chairs we brought, and I saw the man walking towards us. He introduced himself as Doug and said that he cooked a lot of extra food if we wanted any. We politely declined and told him we had already ate, but we appreciated the offer. He said, hey, as long as you guys have eaten, it's no big deal. He waved again and set off back to his camp. About an hour later, he comes back with a brown paper bag and comments on this music we were listening to. Says how back in the 70s, he went to all these festivals and basics, just rambles on about how it's awesome that we're so young and still keep classic rock alive. He notices that my friends have guitars and actually yells over to his wife to come on over. By this point, we don't think anything weird of it. We just didn't know him or his wife. And he was obviously drinking and just invited themselves into our space. None of us had the spine to say anything to him about it, so we all just sat around the fire trading stories. As much as three 17-year-old boys can, with a couple probably in their late 50s, maybe early 60s. After what seemed like a lifetime of bullshitting stories with these people, we don't know, he starts trying to know us on a more personal level, super polite but obviously a little drunk, asks if we have jobs or if we're in school and we all replied. He says that he works at a United supermarket as a stalker and has for the last 15 years. Basically says that if any of us need a job at any time, that if we put him as a reference, he would get us on. He says his full name for us to reference just in case any one of us wants to apply. This is very important later. Anyways, finally the wife starts nodding off, all liquored and bundled up. She fell asleep in her chair. Luckily, that was the cue for Doug to get her back to camp and put her to bed. When they walked off back towards their site, the three of us look at each other and rolled our eyes because we were all such doormats and basically let the stranger come run all over us. We see that it's close to midnight, so we decided to put out the fire and get ready for bed. Doug trots back over to our site. He asks us if we were here all weekend or not. We told him we only had enough money to stay for one more night and that we'd be heading back to town in the morning. He said he really enjoyed the company and that he'd personally pay for us to stay another night if we wanted to. We politely declined his offer and he started back off to his RV. He quickly turns back around and says, Remember guys, if any of you need a job, just call up to United on Jim Lake Road and tell them Doug, redacted, sent you. We smiled and said thanks and he left for good that time. That night actually got considerably cold and we decided to pack up and head back to our warm beds in town at around 4 a.m. 
As we were leaving the canyon, we almost hit a deer and veered off the road. Everyone was okay, but we were definitely shocked because it was so late and we hadn't gotten any sleep at that point. Us almost hitting the deer was practically the climax of our trip to the canyon that weekend, and we all continued back to school on Monday like normal. One of my friends that was with me on the camping trip was actually in my third period class on Mondays, and we started talking about how that guy Doug and his wife were pretty cool, despite not taking the hint that we did not care to hang out with them. I asked my buddy if he could remember Doug's last name, and somehow he did, so I googled him. Big mistake. Guess who was a ten times over registered sex offender, who almost all of his victims were boys from age 12 to 17. You guessed it, Doug. This rocked our world. We had somehow, some way, just barely escaped the clutches of this pedophile. What would have happened to us if we took up his offer to stay another night? I was so suspicious of this dude and couldn't get the scenario off my mind that I decided to call United Supermarket to tell the manager that one of his employees was being really creepy to us kids and that he might want to be weary of the people he hires. And guess what? Nobody by Doug's name has ever worked for United. He bullshitted us all night long trying to get us drunk to do God knows what to us, innocent kids. Be careful who you talk to. As a child, I grew up in Sydney, Southwest Australia, a suburb called Rose Meadow. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Well, there are no roses, and half of the suburb is housing commission and was known for being a rough area. Nevertheless, I enjoyed my childhood, and me and my friends made the most out of what we had. So we spent a lot of time playing in the local bushland. We rode bikes, made tree swings, caught frogs, and, you know, just explored kid things. I dare say I know that bushland like the back of my hand. There was never really anything eerie about that bush, except for the fact that there was a nursing home located on the western side of the bushland upon a large hill called Kilbride Nursing Home, which security would patrol, so we got chased out of that section of the bushland quite a few times. Behind the nursing home were catacomb-type structures built as if they were going to construct another building, but never got around to finishing it. We explored these random concrete foundations with cave-like half-dirt, half-brick structures. It seemed like people used to hang out here or even sleep here as we found canned food, some old dirty bongs, old clothes, and just random shit. Anyway, life goes on and it's 2003 now and I'm 14 years old. I dabbed with marijuana and thought it would be an awesome idea if me and my two friends pitched a tent on the western side of the bushland, further down a valley from the nursing home so we wouldn't get too close to the security car's patrol paths. I think we bought a $40 tent from Kmart, and at about 4 p.m., we hiked to the chosen location to set up the tent before the sun went down. I managed to get some weed, had a bong, and it was all three of our first times properly smoking. We were all excited, as I imagine most kids would be, when they're about to experience something new and exciting. We did not tell anyone about our plan, as we knew we were going to experiment with drugs, and didn't want anyone, including our parents, finding out. The sun went down, and I remember we had a little fire going, and we all had a cone each. My friends were in deep conversation, and my mind drifted off as I suddenly felt a presence around us, and as if someone were watching us. My ears pricked up, and I felt super sensitive, thinking I could hear rustling in the distance, but wasn't quite sure. 
My two friends were having a good old time giggling like schoolgirls as they sat across the fire from me. Blaming on the weed, but I got paranoid and flailed my arms around sternly, let out a shh to my friends. They looked at me like, what the fuck? And I whispered, did you hear that? And before I could finish my sentence, an eerie voice howled from the darkness, piercingly loud. I know where you are. Sounded kind of like a crackhead. I was shocked and glared at my friends to gauge their reactions because surely they had heard that too. And yep, after about two seconds of us all frozen in shock, we all bolted up and our instincts just had us running back towards the nursing home to exit the bushland. Whilst running, I saw a large dark silhouette figure of what resembled someone in a cloak, like a grim reaper standing on top of the catacomb half-built infrastructures as we ran through the valley. When I saw the figure, I remember thinking, what the fuck? But wasn't going to stop to investigate it more. We finally reached the exit of the bushland and looked back in relief and confusion at the bush, in which point we all saw a white apparition at the bottom of the hill coming towards us. We continued to run back to my house as it was close to the bushland. I got affirmed by my friends that that just happened and we all experienced the same thing. Pretty sure we just slept at my house that night, not wanting to go back to the bush until the sun was out. The next day, we went back to the tent and cleaned up our mess. And although we had had a bad experience during the night, playing in the bush was our thing. We continued to enjoy it during light hours. As we were playing by the tree swing, which was about 15 meters away from where we had the tent set up that night before, we suddenly hear the shrieks and screams of what sounded like a young girl who then yelled, help me. And then the sound of someone starting up a chainsaw. I looked over the mound of where the tree swing was, but couldn't see much through the thick shrub. I didn't even think people could get to that side of the brush, as there was no flat ground or pathways, just thick bushland. So once again, we all ran back to my house and got my dad to bring my dog and come help us search. What was very bizarre was that when we reached my house, there was an old Chinese man riding his bike around the front of my house who wore a bucket on his head as a helmet. I had seen that guy around town before and just always thought, ha, how strange, he wears a bucket. But this time, he was riding right near my house, kind of just circling around, and the look he gave me made me feel very uncomfortable. We took my dog down to the bush and again found nothing. These experiences have made me wonder and think, sometimes even question me and my friend's sanity. Were we all going through the same psychosis? Was the Chinese bucket hat man mystical in some way and fucked with us for fun? Who yelled out to us? Who was the girl screaming? Was there actually a crazed maniac with a chainsaw ready to slaughter her? Does the nursing home hold dark energies and entities that play tricks on people in the bushland? To this day, I will not know the truth, but it was all very strange. If anyone who reads this knows Rose Meadow Bush and has had similar experiences, please, please, please let us know. Thank you for listening. It was early spring 2016. I had just turned 24 years old. My friend and I reached our main spot to camp, Black Canyon Rim Campgrounds, just outside of Payson, Arizona. We'd usually travel out there two to three times each year. It has some incredible views and is only a couple hours away from the city. For the most part, this area was pretty secluded. A privately owned convenience store rested a few miles away. 
the small town 20 miles before that. The entrance was on a dirt road directly off the highway with a campground sign at the start of the road, marking local wildlife, any fire hazards, and general news relevant to camping folk. The pathing is mostly linear with maybe one fork spanning several miles. We once traveled down the dirt road to see how far it would take us. One of the paths would take you to another highway entrance with a ranger's tower halfway there. The other path led to a dead end. An abandoned cabin can be found at this path a few miles in, mostly hidden off in the distance between some larger foliage. The snow had mostly cleared up at this point, leaving the crisp air, a slight chill, and fauna becoming active again. We'd usually spot some wild horses, several deer, and tons of little critters whenever we would come out this way. It really was the perfect time of year for a relaxing trip to get away from the city for a few days. We got in at around 4 p.m. on a Tuesday. It was late for us, as we'd usually try to make it out there by at least noon. This trip was pretty spontaneous. We both had, we both had work during the coming weekend and decided to just go for it. The sun was setting fast and we still hadn't picked our spot to camp. There were maybe two other groups, both families parked somewhat close to the entrance, only a few hundred yards away from the highway. This time around, we just wanted to get away from humans for a while. Customer service jobs will do that to you. We drove down the dirt road, past our usual spot, and finally picked the perfect area. A small clearing, just hanging off the edge of a hill. The whole valley could be seen from this area with a beautiful sunset. This would have been our main spot from then on, if the next neighbor's incident never happened, that is. We agreed to get a campfire going and would just avoid building a tent this trip. We didn't have much time to do so anyway, and her car wasn't that uncomfortable. I'd sleep in the back seat and she'd take the passenger seat. With the windows slightly ajar, we'd have a few blankets for each of us and would fall into that unrivaled slumber. The next day went fairly uneventful. We just decompressed. I had this strange feeling throughout the day though, like we were being watched. There were crunching of leaves just out of sight every few hours, but I figured it was just the local wildlife doing their thing. My friend didn't notice anything unusual, so I didn't dwell on it. Night came, and the feeling still hadn't gone away. My friend must have felt something she didn't vocalize, though. She took some of her sleeping pills. She didn't usually need to take them on our camping trips. The nature's ambience was enough to put anyone to sleep, or so I thought. It was nearing 1 a.m. My friend dozed off in the passenger seat while I attempted to wind down in the back. I leaned across the side window, behind the passenger seat, legs outstretched to the car's back door. The window opposite of me was rolled down slightly, with a cold breeze flowing in. I had been on my phone, scrolling through Facebook or whatever, when I heard something outside. A few crunches of the fallen leaves, several paces outside the car, I whispered to my friend, did you hear that? But she was already out. I put my phone down and listened intently for a minute or two. Nothing. It must have been a small animal, curious of the camp. I went back to my phone, scrolling through social media. About 10 minutes had passed when I heard it again. Crunch. Right outside the door. I lowered my phone. My eyes took a moment to adjust from the light of the phone and into the deep dark of the woods. As I turned the phone away from me, the backlight illuminated the window above my feet. To this day, I can't get the image out of my head. Two dirty, scabbed hands held onto the window. The fingers wrapped inside the car. The nails were long, unkept, and dark. Before the window, a silhouette of a face was pressed up against it. The breathing would create condensation every few seconds. All I could make out 
were the reflections of those empty, black eyes. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. It felt like eternity. The staring contest between me and this... thing. Thoughts were repeating incessantly in my head. Why haven't they ran away when they saw I noticed them? What were they planning? Is this the face of death? After probably 10 seconds of not doing anything, the hand slowly unclenched the window and receded into the darkness. The condensation on the window dispersed. Another couple seconds passed before I heard the dreaded crunch, 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 melodically falling into the distance. I still just sat there. What in the fuck just happened? Why didn't I do anything? Why am I still not doing anything? With that thought, my body shot straight into adrenaline. I pounded on my friend's seat, waking her up from her slumber into a dizzy confusion. I unlatched and kicked open the back door and took a moment to scan the area. Whoever they were, whatever they were, it was gone. I scrambled to pick up any important camping supplies we left outside and just crammed everything into the back seat and trunk, periodically looking over my shoulder, listening for those footsteps. I slammed the back door shut, and there they were, a grim reminder of the horror that just happened. Two handprints imprinted on the window. I quickly wiped them off the window in a panic, a reaction to erase the event, I guess. I jumped into the front seat, started the car, and floored it out of there. My friend, finally coming to, asked me what the hell I'm doing. We gotta go, I said. There's, there's something out there. I didn't see whatever or whoever it was while fleeing the scene. Speeding down the dirt road, my friend insisted I slow down, and I eventually did. We reached the highway and I proceeded to drive 20 or so miles before we reached a Denny's where my friend asked us to stop because they were hungry and I would explain everything. The nightmare subsided a few months later. My embarrassment continues to this day for the state of shock I was in at the time. Everybody says you either have a flight or fight instinct and I'm confused whether I have either. I mean, I just sat there and did nothing. I frequently tend to ask myself who was out there. Another camper messing with us? A resident of the abandoned cabin down the dirt road? Or maybe something more paranormal residing in the forest, watching lone, vulnerable campers as they drift off to dreamland. We'd still go camping there in the years ahead, but never too far from the highway. Whatever it was, I hope that was the last we had seen of it. So I've had a few let's not meet encounters and several creepy encounters from where I live, the people I encounter on a daily basis, etc. This happened a few years ago when I was around 13. I was somewhat popular in school at the time, and I had around four very, very close friends. Rose, Lynn, Noah, and Zach were the main names. We went on many adventures around that time, camping, road trips, the beach. Noah's family was pretty wealthy, and all of our families were pretty lenient with rules. One day, the summer before eighth grade, we went on a camping trip with Lynn's older sister, Margaret, and Zach's older brother, Todd. So there were seven of us, Lynn and Zach and I were 13, Noah and Rose were 14, and Margaret and Todd were both 17. We decided to go camping in a nearby forest, around 20 miles from Noah's house. It was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Noah's house and his neighborhood were the closest homes, and there were no signals for phones or any electronics. We went to the spot easily and without problems, and we made camp. The girls in one tent, the boys in another. Maybe it was a bad idea to have seven teenagers 
ages 13 to 17, with no phone in the woods. But our parents were lenient, like I said, and confident we would be fine since the woods were not known for anything bad or dangerous. So we set up the tents, go swimming in a nearby lake, and come back and make dinner over a fire, which was about 20 feet away from the tents, which were 4 feet away from each other, by the way. We have s'mores and do all those stupid camping things before Lynn and Margaret announce they are going to sleep. That left Todd, Rose, Zach, and Noah, and I, as we joked around, told scary stories, and just overall had a really good time. Then Margaret walks up annoyed and tells us that whoever it is messing with the side of the tent to stop it. Keep in mind, no one left the group and tents were far enough away to not bother anyone in their tents. She explained that someone kept on touching the side of the tent, running something on it, and we dismiss her. Todd states that it probably is a tree branch and Rose and I decide to go to sleep as well. So we head back to the tent. Lynn is asleep and we settle in. Me, closest to the opening, Margaret next to Lynn, who is at the opposite side of the tent, but Rose in between Margaret and I. I managed to fall asleep easily within five minutes until I woke up suddenly for what seemed like no reason. I checked my phone. I still brought it in a portable charger just to take pictures and it was literally in the middle of the night, 2.15 to be exact. I looked around, my eyes getting used to the darkness, trying to figure out why I woke up. A tapping sound on the tent was what I first noticed, and a soft giggling. It sounded somewhat deep, like a male voice, but I couldn't be sure. After what felt like an hour was probably a minute or two, the tapping and giggling stopped. I was convinced it was my imagination, or maybe one of the boys trying to prank us, or even a tree branch like Todd suggested earlier. Telling myself it was a tree branch and lack of sleep, I fell back asleep until Rose woke me up around dawn. Everyone was awake and we decided to hike a little. We decided to go into two groups because we planned on spending the night again and we didn't want anyone messing with our stuff. Even though these woods were popular with camping, we didn't want to take any risks. Margaret, Len, Rose, and I left to go hiking for a couple of hours while the boys opted to stay behind and fish, swim, and cook food. We hiked for about two hours and we came back to the boys not at the campsite. Annoyed, Margaret went down to the lake with Lynn to find them. Rose and I made our way back to the tents, and I'll be honest and say I screamed and almost pissed myself. The tents were all slashed. I inspected it closer after regaining composure because I was usually the more collected one out of the two of us. The tears all seemed to be made with a small knife as the cuts were very small. Our tents were made of material that was pretty hard to cut into, and it seemed like the person had a pocket knife, I guess. The boys, Margaret and Len, came running to our screams, and were obviously startled. We decided to pack up and head home early, because for one, the tents were ripped too much to use again comfortably, and two, Rose, Len, and I were extremely creeped out. Even more so, Todd announced that his tires were slashed. We were all freaking out, obviously. There was no cell service. Todd's tires were slashed, and there was no way any of us wanted to stay any longer. Luckily, Todd reported that Margaret's tires looked fine, and Margaret stated that she would take Noah and Len, drop them off to call 911 and their parents, and come back for us. She drove a car and there wasn't enough room for more than three people as the back was also filled with the camping stuff. Zach, Todd, Rose, and I were left at the campgrounds and we decided to begin a hike back towards the main road so Margaret wouldn't have to drive so far. Also, Rose and I refused to stay anywhere near that camp space. We began hiking. My phone died. 
the last time I looked at it, it was one in the afternoon, I think. Zach and Rose both had working phones and constantly updated us on how far we had been walking. I began to hear branches snapping from behind us, closer to the trees than we walked, and I got more and more paranoid as time went on. I told Todd and he seemed to get more wary of our surroundings, constantly looking over his shoulder. We had been walking for about 30 minutes. Margaret was probably at Noah's house or almost there when Todd screamed, run. Naturally, I looked behind my shoulder before I began running. Three hooded figures were running towards us. Two had knives and they all looked around six foot three or taller. Todd was six foot one, but I doubted he could defend all of us against them. Even then, it was broad daylight. I couldn't make out any facial features. They all appeared over or around 200 pounds. The shortest one was probably six foot two, but they all wore hoods and had masks on. Like ski masks. It sounded totally fake and I don't care if you don't believe me, but I was scared shitless that day. We began running and the three guys finally gave up or decided we weren't worth terrorizing because we lost them. We made it to the main road where we waited, walking quickly, constantly looking over our shoulders in fear until Margaret arrived. We told the police everything and they searched the woods nearby. They never found any evidence we had been there or the guys were there or that anything happened besides pictures of the lake around the area and the shredded tents. I don't know what would have happened if they had caught us. I'm fairly tall. I was around five foot 10 during this time, only at around 125 pounds. Rose was around five foot one and 100 pounds. And Zach was barely five foot nine at the time. He probably outweighed me by 10 pounds maximum. I am so thankful that I told Todd about them. I have no doubt they would have been able to catch us if he hadn't been looking over his shoulder constantly. And I am so thankful we all got physical activity regularly, were fast enough to outrun them, and they gave up. So, whoever you guys were, let's never ever meet again. I'd never been a big fan of camping. Circa 2012, for some reason or another, my friend and I decided to take a Saturday night to camp on private property. We had permission from the owner. On the small bank of a small lake in the rural American Southeast. The lake wasn't very large, probably only 50 to 150 yards across. Not great for estimating distance. It was more of a deep pond but it was five times as long as it was wide from the perspective of our camp. It consumed the majority of our sight line. The plot of land itself wasn't entirely removed from civilization. We were five to 10 miles outside of a small suburb of a mid-sized Southern city. It definitely was not easy to access. However, and the only way in was a gated, narrow dirt road across a levee which spanned one side of the lake. This road was gated and locked. The owner gave us his code. We pulled the car through and locked the gate behind us. If you've ever been down south, you know how quickly it gets isolated outside of cities. Our cities are small and the rural people around often live rough and wild. We have dense woods so thick that they're not worth building in unless you have some connection or attachment to the area. I've heard it was not profitable to cut roads through a lot of it when they were building highways in the 50s. So not much development has happened in the last hundred years and in some places since the Civil War. It's not uncommon to go for a 30 minute drive straight out of town and come upon cabins that are obviously off the grid. My friend and I were used to living in the suburbs, so we were just happy to see stars and hear the sounds of nature. 
We were at our very utilitarian camp, small Coleman two-person tent and a blanket, simply looking around and enjoying the night when suddenly my buddy sat up real straight. He said something like, do you see that guy over there? He pointed to the other side of the small lake. I didn't see anything. I sat up slightly and said, nah, it's just the dark playing tricks on you. He seemed actually shaken. No, look, there's a bunch of faces behind the trees now. That got my attention and I set up fully, rubbing my eyes to try to gain full focus. And then I saw them. Small, round, white faces stared back at me from across the lake, maybe 15 to 20 of them. All were positioned in such a way that their bodies were behind the trees and only their heads were visible. The best way I can describe the faces is like very pale, somehow internally illuminated children. I should mention that neither of us were drinking or high. We were too young for that. Not for at least a few more years. We had eaten dinner at home and we were just planning on going to sleep after chilling out for a while. The faces weren't moving. I was kind of sitting there in shock, thinking that my eyes would adjust and I would see that they were a reflection, bugs or maybe owls or just something. But I would never come to that realization. I stared right back at them for what felt like five minutes, looked back at my friend and then they were gone. Bodies of water carry sound extremely well, and we heard extensive shuffling from the other side of the lake, and a couple of small branches snap. It's incredible what your ears pick up on during an otherwise silent night. My buddy was tearing up a little when he said, What the hell were those? And I didn't have a good answer. Neither of us slept particularly well. I definitely felt validated in my feelings of disliking camping. But what were we going to do? I tried to do some research on the internet, but never found a phenomenon that could explain what we saw. Back in 2011, I was within a circle of friends that made it a tradition to go camping at a certain spot every May long weekend. The spot we chose was in a beautiful area right on the edge of a large lake and was located on government land. The lake itself had a dam on it, so during May long, the water levels were always low, if not completely empty, making it possible to walk across it. People were allowed to camp there as long as they weren't causing any trouble or making a mess, and it was generally a good time for everyone. The spots themselves were spaced far enough apart that you had your own privacy, but not far enough that you couldn't meet other people. In this particular year, our spot was in the middle of a small hill, with one campsite below us and one above us. The first night of our trip happened without incident. During the second day, the people staying at the site below us had moved in. We didn't think much of it and continued drinking throughout the day and into the night. At about around midnight, the people at the campsite below us were really out of control. They were yelling and screaming and their music had gotten even louder, so our friend Ben went down to ask them to turn it down. He was promptly punched in the face and he came back to inform us that he was 90% sure they were on drugs. After that, the vibe wasn't as relaxed and we were all somewhat on edge. I was feeling really tired so I just decided to go to bed. Some of my friends were still awake including Ben and one couple, Lily and Derek, that were visiting another campsite we had made friends with that day. I could hear that the campsite below us was still blasting their music and partying very hard, but I just tried to ignore it and go to sleep. I don't know what time it was when I was jolted awake. Parts of this are somewhat a blur. All I know is that I sat straight up as soon as I heard the screaming and yelling coming from outside my tent. 
I quickly ran outside to find our campsite in chaos. One of my friends was clutching their chest. People were running around and screaming to call 911. I was quickly informed of what happened. Apparently, not long after I had gone to bed, the people camping at the site below us decided they weren't finished talking to Ben and on their way up, Lily and Derek walking back. Now, Derek and Ben are about the same height and have the same hair color, so, so they thought and assumed that Derek was Ben and bottled both of them and Lily over the head with a full glass bottle. I don't know if it was the same guys that showed up at our campsite, but I was told that everyone else was sitting around the fire when two or three huge guys appeared from the darkness and walked over to them. One had a paring knife and the other had a butcher's knife in their hands. Ben saw the knives and had gotten up to talk to them and had barely spoken a word when the guy with the paring knife stabbed him once in the chest. At the same time, some people from the campsite above had seen the guys coming and came down to help. One of the guys, Tim, was coming down the hill when the guy with the butcher's knife ran up to him and stabbed him in the stomach. From there, sheer panic ensued. People called 911, but the ambulance was over a half an hour away. This is where I came out of the tent. Tim's wound was bleeding profusely, and he was losing a lot of blood way too quickly. His friend ended up putting him in the back of his car and speeding off to meet the ambulance halfway. Ben was also bleeding, but his wound wasn't as deep as Tim's, and we were able to keep him calm until an ambulance arrived. The guy with the knives ran off into the darkness, back down to their campsite, and took off in their Land Rover. My boyfriend at the time and I had gotten into his car and drove to the entrance to try and flag down the policemen on their way to the scene. Once they arrived, we were informed to stay in the car, as they had released a canine search unit to hunt down the people who stabbed our friends. By the end of the night, they had arrested the men. They had tried to flee by driving their vehicle across the lake bed where, luckily, they got stuck in a muddy section of the lake. They were on a concoction of several drugs, as suspected. Luckily, both Tim and Ben survived, although Tim had a loss of a lot of blood and took a few weeks to recover from his wounds. Derek and Lily had huge goose eggs, and possibly one person had a concussion, but I can't recall. It was definitely the scariest thing I have ever experienced, and a few of us had to testify against them in court. It took a while for us to go camping again, but a year later, we took another trip to the same area with no issues. This incident has been playing on my mind because last week it came up in my time hop, so I thought I would share it with you. So last summer, I booked a glamping trip in the next county over. The website looked beautiful, a campsite of six large yurts outside a lovely little village. Coincidentally, I had driven through that village before as it's close to a really nice historic castle I like to visit occasionally. So we pay our money and my husband, two kids and I pitch up. It's one of the last weekends of the summer and it was lovely weather. The campsite was on a small hill and the people who owned it lived on top of the hill in their farmhouse. We were checking in on a Sunday for two nights as we were shift workers at the time. We passed other people checking out and they all looked happy. The owners of the site showed us down to our yurt and mentioned that we were the only ones on the site for our stay this time, it being a Sunday. We were happy with that, to be honest, because with two young kids, it meant they could make noise if they wanted and would not disturb anyone. When she showed us around, she did say that the yurt door didn't lock, but none of them did. Which, okay, fine, because you don't lock a tent, right? The place was in its own mini wooded area, and it was absolutely beautiful. 
The owner also mentioned the kids would be safe to wander because they had perimeter fences because of their dogs. The first night was fun. We had a barbecue, the kids played, and then went down to sleep at about 8. I found it hard to sleep, but I often do when I'm somewhere new. There was only patchy phone coverage, so we read until we fell asleep. The next morning, my husband seems a little bit out of sorts, and I asked him if he was all right, and he was all, yep, I'm fine. So I left it. We went out for the day and had a great time. The whole day was blazing hot, and then we got back, was washing up for dinner, and the kids were playing, and a shadow came over the entire place. I felt eyes on me, and it went really cold. Honestly, it felt like something bad was going to happen. I felt dread hit me. We'd already paid to stay, but I pulled my husband to the side and said, We have to leave right now. I don't know why. I've just got a bad feeling. Please, let's go home. Normally, he'd try and talk me out of something like this, but he didn't. He started getting the kids together and I packed our stuff. We went to the farmhouse where the couple who owned it were set outside playing with their dogs. My husband started loading up the car while I apologized to them and explained we needed to leave because our youngest was feeling ill. They said how sorry they were about it and then just as I turned to leave, the man owner asked if my husband had been outside the house last night. About three, maybe four in the morning, I said no. He hadn't left my side all night. I would have woken up, obviously. He asked me if I was sure. By this point, my husband was by my side and answered that no, he hadn't and why. Well, says the guy, the security lights came on and the dog started barking. And when we looked outside, there was a man wandering around who then turned around and walked back down in the direction of the yurts. They assumed it was my husband. We both said it wasn't and said our goodbyes quickly. I tore out of that place in the car and then about a quarter mile down the road, my husband turned to me and said, you're right, I was quiet this morning. I didn't say anything because I thought you'd take the piss. I wanted to use the bathroom in the wee hours, but as I was about to get up, I heard footsteps on the decking outside. Not hooves or something like four legs, something on two legs. I lay there as quiet as possible and hoped the kids wouldn't wake up or something. Nope, nope, nope. It still freaks me out now. Since then, we have yet to return to that camping area. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true horrific camping stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Nate Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Tammy Slayton, Colt Stonewall, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes, for without you, there would not be a channel or me. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, stay safe out there. Please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.